Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And as always, hit the subscribe button, everybody. We have an amazing show for you, because board the mothership is Kate Hewlett. You know her as Jeannie Miller on Stargate Atlantis. She recently wrote the screenplay for The Swearing Jar, starring Kathleen Turner, Patrick J. Adams, and David Hewlett. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Miss Eula. Thank you so much for coming to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Thank you for having me. It's totally my pleasure. I'm very excited to see um, Swearing Jar when it hits the States. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited for it to get there. I, I think a lot of people are going to be because, like I said, it, it sounds really good uh, as we're going into more details about the actors who are in it. People mm-hmm. are very excited. Um, so I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for film and who are your earliest influences? Ooh, uh well this to, to be honest this one started as a play uh so it's it's uh it, it adapted into a film but uh i originally was obsessed with theater and um i have a few different influences there one of one of them is basically the same age as me but is like the best writer in the world and her name is hannah moscovich so she inspired me a lot um and then with film i guess i would say um a good question i suppose there are specific films that have inspired me more than like specific filmmakers Mm -hmm. um but i but i would say pt anderson is like absolutely top of my list um and there are films like um Truly Madly Deeply was a big inspiration for me, huge inspiration because it really does feel like a play in some ways. I also loved Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Mm. Loved that. That was big. Those were two inspirations for this actual film. Um, Yeah, that's kind of where I would where I would start. Well, do some research on it. Your background is amazing. You graduated from the National Theater School of Canada, uh, Queen's University the Tarragon Playwrights Unit, and the Canadian Film Center's primetime television program. Man, that, that's a lot of school, right? <laughs> you, you did a well, lot I have of programs. No money. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so how did, um, so what did you learn al- along this path when all these different schools, I mean, did one teach you one area better than the other? Uh, what I learned from, so the first one was Queens University, had a great time, learned how to drink tequila, <laughs> and I um, made a lot of good friends. And then I, I, I sort of, I started actually, I wanted to be a teacher. So I started in English and then I found my way back into drama. Um, I think I, I thought I couldn't make a living. So I kept trying to move away from it, but it kept pulling me back. So that I, I got back into drama at Queens. And then I took a couple of years and tried to be an actor and that wasn't, I wasn't ready yet. And so then I went to national theater school, got to live in Montreal for a few years, which totally just opened my eyes to so many things. And I really, truly fell in love with theater there, made friends for life and met some incredible, inspiring teachers. And I started writing plays while I was there. So that is actually the biggest thing that came out of it for me was that they sort of forced us to write. And I just couldn't stop. I was writing and writing and writing the whole time I was there. I started writing songs. I started writing plays and uh, I started writing Swearing Jar. And so that was 2000 and three 2002 that this play actually started to um develop so prior to entering uh, the schooling with queen's university and tarragon playwrights and 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 all those other uh institutes that you've been to was writing something that was in your radar on your radar when you were like in high school leading into it or was it uh, a spark that just found you later I always loved writing. I I um I wrote a novel when I was uh, you know in grade four. Like I was I always was writing all the time, and I wrote poetry a, a ton. That was sort of my favorite thing to do was write write poems and uh, a lot of feminist poetry when I was in high school. I got really into that, and then that sort of morphed into songwriting as I got older. Uh, I never was good at short stories. I never enjoyed writing short stories. And when I discovered 
writing for stage and for screen, I really felt like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then I always try to get a little dash of music in there as well. So as a playwright and uh, obviously now a very successful playwright, how did you, well, it's coming, it's very jar it's going to a movie. That's, that's a hell of a, a thing to put on your cap. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if it takes me 20 years, <laughs> it's hey, going to be. <laughs> oh, oh, who was it? Harper Lee only ever did one book, but was one of the greatest of all time. So it yeah. only takes the one, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so someone who has written, you know, once again, you did music um, over time, you know, wrote songs, plays, eventually you go into screenwriting. Mm -hmm. What skill in, as a writer is most um, highlighted as a playwright? Imagination. Imagination. I would say imagination because as a playwright, you have a lot of freedom. You can play around with structure quite a bit, I find. You can play around with convention. You also figure out how to tell big stories with no budget for the most part and with you know fewer people. Um, so you have to use your imagination. And one, one teacher at NTS um, said to us, always make impossible requests in everything you do. And I love that. So I try to always do that. I'll put something in that seems like it's impossible, but you just, it just means you have to think a little harder. So that would be the, the big thing probably that came out of that. And then also character, you know, really, mm -hmm. really knowing who the characters are. But I think, I think having started as an actor, I think that I kind of get that for free, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I've, that's always how I see things is through the characters. So that uh yeah that was more of a th that came more easily but i think i think imagination would be my answer <clears throat> so when you're thinking about a theater and the stage it's a very limited amount of real estate that an entire story has to be told on on some level is it stifling is it fuels for imagination how does you, how do you view that restriction i don't find it stifling no i although it was quite freeing to go from a play to a movie, you know, to adapt, because I adapted The Swearing Jar myself. And it was nice to be like, oh, they can go outside. <laughs> I mean, they do, <laughs> do in the play too, but you know, you can, there are certain things you can do that you can't really do in a play or yeah. in this play. And um, I guess, yeah, again, you know, if you use your imagination in a play, you almost have more freedom. You know, mm. you can, you can, do anything and it's not expensive. Um, but I do love the freedom of film as well. And I also being able to have way more people, way more characters, I, I really mm. enjoy that too. But I think it's a good exercise to, to, to have the play version where there are, where it's, the, it's its simplest version. Mm. So as you transitioned, as you said, from playwright to a screenwriter, is the primary difference the freedom? Is there a difference on how characters interact in, in a script when, when you have a film? Does any other aspect maybe, or technical aspects change when you are changing the, you know, from a play to now you're going to watch it or you're not going to watch it on screen or a film? Mm -hmm. In general, the scenes are much shorter in film and television, even shorter in television, but in film too, like you really don't often see films that, uh, scenes that go on for pages and pages and pages. And in a play, uh, you can have one scene be the entire two hours. You can have one mm. scene. So um, it wouldn't be a great play. <laughs> um, no, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's uh, that would be the biggest thing. So looking back at some of the history of you as an actor as well, you appeared as Jeannie Miller in Stargate Atlantis. Um, you started an off-Broadway play, uh, Humans Anonymous. So as you mentioned, the importance of character in a play how does being an actor gives you insight into writing a character that maybe another playwright wouldn't have? I think the voices come very easily because of acting. I think you tend to see things through their eyes and you know, you just know what the voice sounds like. You can hear it. And that, I do think that that comes from acting in, in many ways. And so all the characters I, I feel like I, I know that each character speaks differently, but it's still, they still have my voice in some way. Mm. And I don't know. I just, yeah, I understand them from the inside. If that doesn't sound cheesy. <laughs> when you're actually doing the writing, 
Are you mm-hmm. now walking around acting at the scenes, like in your room as, as you're trying to type out the story, playing all the characters? No, no. <laughs> no but what I do, what I do is I, before COVID, I used to always write in coffee shops. I'm one of those people. And <laughs> apparently I didn't know this, but apparently I go like, <laughs> and like, I, I've ha- I have noticed people looking at me and I'm like, oh, what, what? Uh, and my friend was like, oh yeah, you totally talk all the way through the whole thing. I didn't realize that. <laughs> That, that's oh, so yeah. funny because you know, like I, I know, like the cliche is you know, every coffee shop has that one writer that's in the coffee shop, and, I that's, know. and you did it. You're the one that actually pulled it off. And it came oh, <laughs> successful. Or now that you go to a coffee shop and everyone there is a writer right. on there. <laughs> their I felt very unoriginal when I went there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna make a request of you though. This is a, a big important one. When the swearing mm-hmm. jar movie hits Blu-ray. You need a behind the scenes where you're actually doing the writing of it so we can see these reactions <laughs> that you have on screen. So that would be a very viable extra on a Blu-ray. My brother can act it out for you. I'm sure he would love to do that. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to have to make that happen now. Next time when oh, he comes God. on the show, we are definitely going to have him do a personation of you writing. We we had um, our opening night the other, uh, sorry, our premiere the other night. Yeah. And I was wearing very dramatic shoulders. <laughs> and I, you know, I was feeling good. And then I see my brother. He's like, hello, how are you? Like the whole, the whole night. He's like, can you fit through that doorway? Do you need help with that? <laughs> like you might not want to slouch. It looks really weird <laughs> all night, all night. <laughs> I will say for the um, listeners of the show, um, your brother is David Hewlett, which we'll talk about a little bit as well um, as, as we go along. Mm-hmm. That must be, he must be a very interesting brother to have. And he's been, it was a great guest on the show. I can just imagine what he's like as a brother. <laughs> he's ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's amazing. Yeah, he's uh, he's nine years older than me. I like to make sure people know that. And he's the eldest and I'm the youngest of four. And we always got along, actually. We, you know, we we are very mean to each other, but we enjoy it. Um, and we have a lot of we have a lot in common. And we never went through a period of like he never bullied me or anything like that because he was so much older. Like he'd have to be very cruel to, to <laughs> you know, to bully a nine year old when you're 18. Well, like I said, my experience with him on, on, on the show is he's very supportive of you in the swearing jar. He was talking about it. And he was the one who had the great idea to talk with you. So it must be great to have a supportive family. You know, what's very funny in my family is that we're not supportive to each other's faces. <laughs> so you have to get it from someone else. So like, I remember <laughs> David and I chatting at one point and, and David was saying, you know, dad's so proud of you. And I'm like, what? Like, no, dad's really proud of you. I'm like, dad's proud of you. He's like, no, he all, all he ever talks about is you. <laughs> so apparently he just, he just tells everyone else. But <laughs> David's the same because too much, you know, I always thought he didn't like the swearing jar. And then he's like, oh, I don't like music. Or I don't like your songs. Or, or he make fun of me singing. And, uh, so yeah, it's nice that he really, he does seem to really truly love the movie. Mm. That might well, be James. <laughs> well, I mean, you played his sister on Stargate Atlanta. His character, not his, you are his sister. You played his character's sister as well on Stargate yeah. Atlanta. So did you also give you hell then too? <laughs> he, you know, he was actually really great. He uh, he sort of made that happen mm. because he, he originally, there was an early episode, um, Letters Pegasus, I think it was, that he, he um he had to talk to, he, there was some mention of his brother and he said, what about sister? I think sister would be, would be, you know, and he, he planted that seed and then that came to fruition later. And I still had to audition and everything, but um, he, he did plant the seed. And then Martin Garrow wrote, wrote the character in. And I think he had seen us in a movie together. So he knew how our, what our dynamic was like. He knew that we were mean to each other, but we loved each other. And, um, yeah that's funny that you had an audition to be his sister you figured they kind of just already are you know you i can't imagine someone else doing a better job as the sister than the sister wouldn't it have been awful if i hadn't gotten it though i know very awkward you know i hadn't done much at that point i remember someone online because when when the first episode came out it was the biggest thing i'd ever done and Mm. so of course i immediately went to the internet and checked to see what mean things people were saying so and I and I was like oh my god why they're all being so nice because the Stargate fans are very supportive and so then I'm going through and through and waiting until you know until I find a bad one I was like I can't stop until I find a bad one 
And then someone was like, don't quit your day job. <laughs> and you're like, finally, my negative, I can now rest in peace. Finally, I guess. I guess <laughs> like, but it is my day job. <laughs> so thank you. So, um, yeah. You, with the swearing jar, are you still checking social media for responses? Or are you, are you finally like <laughs> walked away and be like, I don't need that shit. Oh, no, I literally just was looking right right before we got on the, <laughs> I just found a bad one. Oh, I found no. A lot of stuff, but I just found a bad one. Yeah. Uh, but no, I still, I still do check. I think, you know, with the movie, I feel way more relaxed about it than I did with the play mm. because the movie exists. It's not changing. It's done. And I'm very happy with it. I think it's beautiful. So it doesn't really matter to me. I don't know. Also it's at TIFF. So even if the reviews are terrible, I feel like we've had this big win and I, they're not terrible, by the way, they're, they're very positive so far. Um, but I, yeah, it just doesn't matter as much to me, uh, with the play, it's hard because the play, the play reviews determine whether or not people come and see it and mm. you really need people there for, for theater. So that's, that's harder. I've, I've had more difficulty with that in the past. You, from the play to the movie, um, so years, a lot of years had passed between um, the time when you first wrote Spurner, you said 2003, 2004, to it being a movie, which I think was completed in 2018. Mm -hmm. Now, having looked at um, the time between the play and the film, had in those years in between, did your opinion or thoughts change in any way, which was um, then changed for the film as you kind of had years to consider different aspects of it? So I started writing it in 2003. But it took me until, I mean, it wasn't finished. I mean, it's, it, it, it's an ongoing process, that play. It really has changed so many times. And actually, um, Samuel French, who did do all the plays, there's this huge publishing uh, company, Samuel French, and they are now called Concord. And they just did a republication. And so I did rewrites even for that. So that I think I finished that a few months ago. So it's still evolving. And that version of the play was actually affected by the film. Mm. So that's kind of an interesting, that, that was very interesting to go back to it afterwards. But I would say it wasn't really, I stopped writing it for a while once it was published the first time, because then I'm like, okay, it's published. I can, I can, I can let it go now. But then I saw a few productions of it and I'm like, I'm not happy. I'm still not happy. And it's a complicated narrative a little bit. I, I don't want to go into it too much, but it's a little bit complicated. And it's one of those things, if you pull, you know, if you pull a thread, it's like, ah, like everything falls apart. So, you, so once you change something, it's a lot of work to, to make it feel good again. Mm. And the, the structure of it is is a little complex. So I think that's why just watching it, I, I would get a sense of something's not quite right. And the movie I feel is the the closest it's ever been to ex to what I wanted it to be. I mean, I, I'm kind of surprised because um, I know the play, I want to get my information correctly, was nominated for a Governor General's Literary Award. It was. Uh, and, and, and when you get that nomination, you kind of feel like, you, I, at least from, from my standpoint, who's not in any way a famous published uh, playwright and a uh, film writer, screenwriter now, would be like, I did it. I'm done. This is my perfection. I just yeah. and, I, and I just carry around to random people and show it to them. So <laughs> even so, even then, you're you're not quite um, happy yet. You're like, this can be even better. Well, I didn't win the Governor General's Award. <laughs> <laughs> Nomination just not right? enough. So it's not just an honor to be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge honor to be nominated, and I I guess no, it's true. I mean, there there have been some big wins along the way, and even with the the screenplay, like we. I think we were first runner up for some huge award. Harold Greenberg. Uh, the Harold, Harold Greenberg award. Um, but yeah, it's more up to, it, it's, it's more my feeling of what, what's not right yet. And I, I think there were things also that didn't age well. You know, there was like a, there was a key plot point that centered around an answering machine <laughs> that didn't age well. Uh, <laughs> and there were other things that I just, saw differently i don't know it just kept evolving but yeah i'm happy now i'm done now yeah I think. 
<laughs> well, for, for our listeners, the title of what we're talking about is called The Swearing Jar, which is a very interesting title. So where does, how does that connect to the idea of the story? So the very beginning of the film, uh, the couple that we're following, Simon and Carrie, very, uh, uh, you know, a, a couple that has a, a lot of witty banter, very much in love, and they, they decide to give up swearing when they get some big news. And uh, so that's kind of how it starts. And then the idea of, I guess, what that means, what swear, different meanings of the word swearing. Um, yeah, that's a horrible answer. <laughs> so no, horrible. no, no I, 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 you're, you're walking a very tight rope of what you can reveal. <laughs> I, I am, yeah. But totally yeah. fair it's enough. Very, the, jar, the jar does feature quite a lot throughout, so. So the, the film is directed by Lindsay McKay. Um, so what was it like working with uh, Lindsay McKay? Because I know on some sets, the writer is like a ghost somewhere in the back of the people forget about. I had a screenwriter not too long ago that I interviewed as well for a different movie. And he's like, oh, I was trained so many times. And at that point, I'm not even allowed on set. They don't, the actors don't know my name. And yeah. for you, what was that experience like working with her? Well, what happened was I had a baby. <laughs> I had a baby. They were shooting. Uh, they were shooting May fourth, I believe, um, right up until the end of May of 2021. Is that right? 2021. And I had a baby May 9th. Right. She came early, and so I actually was not on set at all. And so when I when I saw it, it was really amazing to see because I hadn't been part of that experience at all. I originally was supposed to play a smaller role in it and I couldn't do that because I was extremely pregnant. And then I was going to be, I was going to do a little background, background cameo. And then I went into labor. So, uh, <laughs> so I really wasn't on set at all. I think I was there for one day for, you know, a couple of hours. And I would say that the actors and the director and the producer were very open to hearing because because of how long I had lived with this thing mm. they were very open to hearing my thoughts and why certain lines certain scenes were the way they were and I usually have a very good reason because of like I said there's been so much rewriting that every word is chosen very carefully so uh, we had some incredible discussions actually um, Patrick J Adams who plays Simon in the movie he had so many questions and really smart questions and really uh, thoughtful questions. And we had some very good conversations about why he did the things he did and why he said the things he said. And um, Adelaide Clemens, who plays the lead, she sort of immediately got everything. It all made sense to her. She just, she knew this character and she was drawn to this character and her audition was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, she she literally gets every every comma, every ellipses, ellipses, everything. It's it's like she just got it. So she was also very helpful because she knew why things were written a certain way as well. But I love being challenged in that way by actors, and I love I just love how much time he put into thinking about it, and and that he was almost fighting for the character, and. I really appreciated that. And a few, I think a few lines did change and a few lines I changed for Adelaide as well, because she, she, you know, when, when people have done that much work, you, you listen, you listen to what they're saying and, what, and if something feels wrong. That's, that's cool. It's fine by me. Mm. But so, on set, I was not there. It, I wasn't there at all, really. Is there, is, does it make it a little easier not to be on set? Cause you're not sort of like, oh, oh, wait a second. That, that's not exactly what I wanted or something like that. It's easier for everyone else. <laughs> I mean, certainly I, I, I have a lot of trouble not speaking and I had, you know, I hear things and I can hear the, the words in my head exactly the way I hear them. So I, it's good that I wasn't there. It's good for Lindsay and it's good for the schedule <laughs> that I wasn't there. Uh, Cause also Lindsay, you know, Lindsay was, uh, she's a beautiful director. She has an incredible eye and she's very artistic. And she brought something to it that I would never have, it's it's not how I imagined it would be, but I love it. I love mm. it. 
I love what she did. I love the things she cut out. I love how she shot it. And uh, I think if I'd been on set, I would have been like, um, excuse me, excuse me, you know, <laughs> and I, I'm happy I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And my understanding of, of the story. So in the story, Carrie stages a concert um, about, um, about the relationship um, as a birthday present to her husband, Simon. Yes. Now, my what I read was this has an unintended consequence in the relationship later. Um, yes. Yes. So is there... I mean, is there a message about the cost of doing a good deed? I mean, is that, was that she, is a mistake that she made trying to do this for her husband and what happens later? Not quite. Uh, the, the, the concert is a celebration of their relationship for his birthday. And she has, it becomes clear very quickly that she has feelings for the person who's playing the guitar, um, who's accompanying her. And we start to see these two love stories that are, that are happening and um, we follow her, yeah, the, the journey that she's on there, being in love, essentially being in love with two people and what that means. Now, one of the major ideas, is, like I said, is the idea of soulmates. Mm -hmm. um, can a person have two soulmates? How do you define the, the idea? That's really the question. That, that's the central question, I would say. Um, I think, uh, it's, you know, I can give my opinion on it, which is not necessarily in the play and the movie, but I, I think the, the thing that made me want to write this in the first place was what if you truly can only love one person? Mm. What, if, what if that's the case and it doesn't work, it doesn't work out? What does that mean <laughs> mm. um, for your life? So that's sort of where it started. Um, and then it turned into what happens if there are two of them. Mm. So the concept sounds a lot like, I mean, you're, it, it suggests that once again, you can have two, love two people at once. The question mm -hmm. is from as someone who, like so I'm married to, to my wife, my wife would kill me with the idea of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Would, is the, is there an issue of, is it really love then if it can be so easily also given to this other person? That's what the main character is asking herself. I think um, she is, everything is through her eyes and it is, you know, it turns out to be a little more complicated than we originally suspect. So as the story, you know, as the story plays out, you, you realize that there is, yeah, it's just more complicated, but we go through, we go through the journey with her and I do think we judge her for a lot of the decisions she makes. Mm. And I wanted that. It's, so, it's, a dangerous, <laughs> it's a dangerous game to play because you don't right. want to lose the audience. But I think what happens is that it makes the audience then, I don't know how to explain it. I suppose we make assumptions about people we make assumptions about infidelity. We make assumptions about all kinds of things in other people's lives. And I think when you watch someone, when you go through it yourself, um, or when you watch, uh, uh, when you experience a story where you're going through it with the main character, it's different. You you might hopefully see what it's like on the inside. Now, you want to uh, answer the question, uh, but you can if you want. I'll go masking it. Um, for a, a time frame, how long does the story let go? Because the question I'm, I'm asking is, do we know or does Carrie know if her interest in um, this other person is love or infatuation? How long is this going on for, for her to make that determination that is love? Um, I think it's sort of... It's hard to talk about the timeline, okay. but I will say that he's a catalyst. The new, okay. the new love, Owen, is a catalyst. And I think that's more, yeah, it's newer. It's a newer relationship. She's known Simon for a lot longer, um, but he's... Owen is very important in her life and very important in, in what will happen after the movie. Mm. Well, is that ambiguous? Very, 
very good answer. <laughs> you did a very good job. So one of the major actors in this movie, and it's, and it's really cool, it must have been cool to, to know, is the legendary actor uh, Kathleen mm-hmm. Turner as mm-hmm. Bev. So yeah. what, was, what did that involvement mean for you, and what does she bring to Bev? I mean, it still doesn't feel real. <laughs> That's just one of those bizarre... I mean, she is one of my absolute favorites. I watched Romancing the Stone about 750 times. I love War of the Roses. I love Pritzi's Honor. I love everything she's done. She's amazing. She's amazing. So it was pretty wild to get that news that it was going to be her. It didn't, that that's a life-changing moment. Mm. And then also the, I think one of my favorite moments ever was we did a Zoom read-through and it was the first time I heard all the cast together and, you know, she gets on, just, hello. <laughs> um, and it was, it was, it was pretty wild. She, she really, really got it. And she brings something different too. I love how tough she is. She, she mm. plays the character with very little vulnerability. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. And I wish I had gotten to meet her more. I, right. I, I didn't get to, I was like, we're going to be best friends and she's going to love me. <laughs> and her cat's name is Simon and that's the lead man's name. And it's just <laughs> destiny and we're going to be PFF forever. But I, you know, I had a baby. I also quite like the baby, but um, <laughs> I had a baby. So I didn't get to, I met her for about 10 minutes. And I'm not sure she knew who I was. And uh, yeah, no, she, she, and then she couldn't come to the, the premiere she was supposed to come to the premiere and she had uh she hurt her ankle oh and so that, yeah we found out the day of that she couldn't make it so she's doing all the press i think over zoom uh so again i was like now we're gonna be best friends <laughs> <laughs> well, that's- but alas no <laughs> you gotta go find her now and be like i'm the writer you must like I know. me I know. <laughs> well, cool I gotta write that- something else for her i think that's what has to happen that's gonna be th- that she's your muse yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. the cool thing about her is that, I mean, she has such gravitas. Like, she's one of those people that when she's on screen, she just captures the screen whenever she's on it. Yeah. Now, ha- having not seen the, the play, um, is Bev, well, um, because like I said, she has like this gravitas to Kathleen Turner that's kind of beyond, you know, any room she's in, the oxygen goes to her. You know, mm. that's just kind of how she is. So, mm-hmm. in the story, does Bev occupy that same existence around the people that she's around where yes. it's, when she's on, it's her. Yeah. But, Often, yeah. in fact, she sucks all the ox- oxygen out of the room. <laughs> she says. So yeah, she's perfect for that. She has a lot of, a lot of lines that are just like, Oh my God, did she didn't just say that. And she definitely, you know, she's not in that many scenes, but she commands those scenes and that's mm. what you want with that character. Mm. So she, she did a lovely job. Not surprisingly, yeah. <laughs> it must have worked because it Swearing Jared has just premiered in theaters. What was that experience like to finally see it on the big screen after all this time? I can't put it into words, really. <laughs> I yeah, it was completely surreal. That's what I kept saying over and over again that night. I also haven't seen, I hadn't seen the final version. Yeah. So I was watching it for the first time along with everyone else. And that was pretty special. I love hearing the laughter, you know, I, I, that was amazing. And I loved hearing people laughing at different points. That's my favorite thing is when there's a line and like one person goes, ah! <laughs> and no one else laughs. And then later on <laughs> that person laughs. And that, you know, like that's, that's so much fun because I don't know. I just, people relate to different things. Mm. So it was, it was very special. And, you know, Jane and I were holding hands and Lindsay and I were both so nervous and it was, it was really great. And it felt like people loved it and it, it was sold out and it was a movie, huge movie theater downtown that I used to go to all the time. And it was wild. So had, had considered, you know, this whirlwind just occurred. What was it last Friday? I believe it was last Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Sunday. So have you had a chance to stop and reflect on this path to get you to where you are? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) No, I have a baby. (laughs) (laughs) I, um, I, I missed the, we had a huge swearing jar party last night. And uh, I think that would have been icing on the cake, but my daughter decided that instead of going to bed at seven 30, she was going to stay awake. 
<laughs> indefinitely and not accept the babysitter and uh yeah so i missed my own party oh i know right but uh, i mean reflect on it i guess yeah it's 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 crazy story right to, to be with something for 20 years and then this is the end it's just it's very exciting and very rewarding and i i still can't quite believe it and again, a credit to Jane. Well, let me, keep in mind, you still got to do those extras that, that, that we're demanding now. <laughs> at, at the end of the She's, keep in mind, you still got to do those extra scenes that we're demanding at, at, in the Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh so my God. Kind of... the, uh, the EPK, they, they brought me in to do an interview. And I think it was the day after, two days after I gave birth. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's the worst I've ever looked in my life. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God. So please don't watch that. <laughs> is it, is it going to be on? Is it going to be on the Blu-ray? You think? I don't know. Oh, Probably. oh, that's how they're selling the Blu-ray now. That's how they're going to sell the Blu-ray. I know, right? <laughs> it's all these beautiful interviews, and everyone's like, and Adelaide is like so gorgeous and wonderful and composed and Australian, and uh, all the interviews are beautiful. And then I'm like, ah! <laughs> at the end of the day, that's my what, name. That's what the screenwriter looks like at the end of a movie. <laughs> oh my gosh! Exactly. Yeah. So, so where can our listeners find the swearing jar? So the play you can buy through Samuel French slash Concord Theatricals. You can pre-order the movie on iTunes if you live in the United States of America. If you live in Canada, you're just shit out of luck. <laughs> um, and it will be released. It has theatrical release September, October of this year. So this month, next month in Canada and the US and then we'll find out more later. Hopefully TIFF will help us internationally. Very cool. So what's next for you? I am going to sleep for a while <laughs> and then I am starting a I do like little writer writing rooms here and there for for projects that excite me and so I've been doing that and I'm starting a new job on a Crave show um coming up really soon. So I'll be co-EPing that and writing. And what else am I doing? There's something else I'm forgetting. Something, <laughs> there's something big I'm forgetting. I can't remember. Because, <laughs> because toddler. <laughs> um, I'm oh my God, I'm such an idiot. I have a show that I created with my best friend that um, AMC Studios bought and now we are going into development here in Canada with that show and it's an incredible team like very exciting team of people so I guess I'm allowed to talk about that because it already exists but so Zachary Quinto is is one of our producers and is oh. was supposed to be the lead we'll see what happens in Canada but he I've been working with him now for for two years he's amazing and we have um, Jesse Tyler Ferguson from Modern Family directing and i'm not sure if i'm allowed to talk about this but there you go there that is, is awesome mr spock himself is coming to your show that is awesome yeah. <laughs> he's amazing he's really amazing well yeah. like so and we, we rewrote stuff for him to be in it because like, he plays the banjo and stuff like that and it's a it's another sort of musical kind of show wait, wait. he plays the banjo in real life yeah seriously it's like oh, yeah, really well. oh yeah, my insane. god yeah that, that is a that's the weirdest piece of information I think I have oh, yeah. during the show. Look it up. Google Zach Quinto um, banjo and you will not regret it. I am I am totally doing that. And that's going in my show notes. Make sure you <laughs> look for Zachary Quinto playing the banjo. <laughs> that's, so is it going to be a similar um, style and tone to the swearing jar? Is it something totally Ew. different? No, it's very silly. It's a very silly, very fun, very raunchy show that my my best friend Andrew Musselman and I created together. Very and cool. I don't know. We haven't signed the contract yet with the Canadian network, so I should probably keep it under wraps for now. But it's uh, it's really really fun. Well, when you, when you read it on a true story, yeah. When you're ready to talk about it, you come back on the show. Okay. All right. Please do. That'd be absolutely awesome. Yeah. Well, Miss Hewlett, it was totally a pleasure talking with you, and I can't wait to see the swearing jar. Thank you. I hope you get to see it soon, and uh, it's been nice meeting you. You too. See you later.